I think I just picked up the minister's speaking notes. Um, she says, don't mention, no, never mind. <laughs> um, just in case you're wondering why I had this, cycling is good for the planet, it's equitable, and most of the time it's good for your health. But when, on the 18th of October, I came off my bicycle and fractured my femur, uh, I reflect on the fact that for 36 years of cycling in London, it had been good for my health, but in one dramatic evening, in fact, it was a bit worse than that, I'd been at a dinner at the Royal College of Physicians, and as my wife says sneeringly, you doctors like to dress up and put on posh clothes for your dinners. Why aren't you out there treating patients? But that's my wife's view. Anyway, I was cycling home after the dinner at the Royal College of Physicians, wearing my dinner jacket. And there am I lying on the road in agony, and the ambulance driver takes one look at me and says, he's had a few. I have not, I said. I had two glasses of wine between seven and he's had a few. It was the time when the Speaker of the House was you know, in trouble with Plebgate. And I wondered if this was some sort of revenge. I obviously looked like a toff. Like, but I'm not. I'm really one of you. Anyway, <laughs> your question to the Minister about how many Ministers of Public Health she could name, and I went through and I was sitting next to a former senior civil servant and embarrassed him by saying, how many can you name? One of the problems is I think I can name about eight that I've worked with and you just get to know them and you just get to work with them and they're gone. And they're gone. And that's one of the problems. You know, somebody actually gets into that. I mean, occasionally there's a good side to that. Dawn Primarolo was Minister of Public Health when I was commissioned to do the Marmot Review. She then moved to children's schools and families and asked me to come and see her because she wanted to be sure that I took on board the importance of early childhood in my review. So at least she took with her the concern for health into her new brief. And Caroline Flint took that concern when she went into housing. But it is a problem. Ministers start to master their brief, and then they're gone. Um, so it is, can you have my mobile? You cannot. <laughs> Let me move on. You're going to give it back, I hope. <laughs> it depends how you perform. Um, let me move on to what I want to talk about, which is very much about the fact that the homeless are at the end of the spectrum. We need to understand the determinants of health inequalities and the determinants of the particularly bad condition of the homeless. But it's the end of the spectrum. And I think we've met before. The, um, you've tackled me when we talk about the gradient and you said, where are gypsies and travellers in your report? And my response has always been uh, that we need to deal with the whole gradient and we need to deal with the groups that are excluded. And that's why we use the term proportionate universalism, all in favour of universalist policies. The whole idea being that a health service for the poor is a poor health service. An education system for the poor is a poor education system. We want to bring people into universalist services, but we need to work harder for those most excluded. So the approach that we took in my review of health inequalities in England was a life course approach. We had six recommendations, and I'll come back to them, but on the early years, skill development, employment and work, healthy standard of living, sustainable communities and places, and prevention, and showing how they operate through the life course. And the point about the gradient is made here. On the one-year anniversary and the two-year anniversary of the publication of my review, we published data on uh, life expectancy and healthy life expectancy 
for every local authority in the country, and these are local authorities ranked, um, ranked on the index of multiple deprivation. So the most affluent here, the least affluent there, the most deprived there. And you see this remarkable gradient. And it's not the case that up here at the upper half of the distribution, well, everybody's okay. Even in the upper half of the distribution, the more affluent the area, the longer people live. Yes, down here it's dreadful, but there are degrees of dreadfulness all the way along the distribution. So we should see homelessness as the end of a distribution, not simply as some, well, we'll just deal with the homeless and then the pro problem of health inequality is gone. It hasn't gone. It runs across the whole of society. And in addition, we need to deal with a special problem of those subject to multiple exclusionary processes, which include homelessness. That's male life expectancy. And the other thing to say is they scatter around the line. Very important. Because a key driver of the social gradient in health is the level of deprivation the amount of inequality in society. The fact that the scatter around the line means for a given level of deprivation, some local areas are doing better than others. And we think we have a handle on some of the reasons for that. But it means that you should never throw up your hands and say, well, we can't do anything about the national distribution of wealth and income, so there's nothing we can do. There's a lot we can do. That's why they scatter around the line. And in fact, I was talking in Tower Hamlets, in my cycling days, I cycled out to Tower Hamlets. I was talking Tower Hamlets and showing the link between deprivation and school performance. And the director of education in Tower Hamlets said, your figures are out of date. I said, what do you mean my figures are out of date? Bridling. She said, we've broken the link between deprivation and school performance in Tower Hamlets. We tell ourselves every day that poverty is not destiny. I said, show me. So she sent me the figures. And indeed, in Tower Hamlets, they had reduced the gap between school performance in Tower Hamlets, which is very deprived, and the average. Very important. We need to deal with poverty. But poverty is not destiny. So two approaches, reduce inequalities in society and for a given level of deprivation, improve things, which includes providing good housing. And that's the female gradient, similar. There are multiple exclusionary processes that lead to homelessness, and we need to deal with all of those. 51% of homeless organizations report working with more young people aged 16 to 24 since 2011. The problem is getting worse. Rough sleeping counts and estimates in London and the rest of England, the number of rough sleepers is going up. It's getting worse. We really need to be dealing with this. And it's not totally mysterious how to do it. Suzanne Fitzpatrick, we got this. I think Suzanne's here somewhere, but thank you very much. Um, her data. Well, yes, of course, 78% of those sleeping rough are homeless. Why else are they sleeping rough? But that's not the point here. Survival shoplifting. 46% are homeless, begging, street drinking, alcohol problems, using hard drugs, being admitted to hospital with a mental health issue, 29% were homeless. Prison, young offenders institution, 45% were homeless. It's not law students who get put in prison, it's people who were abused in childhood, who had multiple deprivation, who find themselves homeless, who have problems with drug and mental illness. They're the ones who get put in prison. 
And we think we know what to do about those things. And homelessness influences health, smoking drugs and alcohol consumption, poor nutrition, nine times more likely to commit suicide. This is not a lifestyle choice, being homeless. This is dreadful. Nine times more likely to commit suicide. Infection, chronic disease, distress, anxiety, loss of self-identity and self-esteem. I had figures for the mean age at death of homeless, but they're misleading, of course, because mean age at death is not the same as life expectancy. The mean age at death in a children's centre is very low. The mean age of death in an old people's home is very high because homeless people tend to be the younger end. When they die, they die at a relatively young age. So the mean age of death is misleading. Uh, if we really want to get a handle on it, we need proper life expectancy data. And the distribution of causes reflects the young age, uh, but 21.7% due to drugs, 14% due to alcohol. And then cancer of cardiovascular disease relatively low because they are young. Suicide, an undetermined intent. And from Andrew Haywood, thank you, Andrew. <laughs> um, looking at index of multiple deprivation, you see the social gradient and risk of asthma, and then the homeless <laughs> goes up. So it's a gradient, but the homeless, as I said, are the extreme end of the gradient. Stroke, again, it's pretty much a gradient, and then increased for the homeless. Epilepsy, epilepsy doesn't show much of a gradient, but big increase in the homeless. And heart disease shows a gradient, the lower you are in the hierarchy, the higher the risk, and an increase amongst the homeless. So it's the end of the spectrum. The same set of factors that account for the social gradient in health account for the extra health problems amongst the homeless, only more so. So we have twin imperatives, prevent people becoming homeless, and that's got two aspects to it. One is the individual characteristics that lead to someone being becoming homeless. And the second is the supply of homes. And there are fewer houses, more people, I mean, two into one won't go. Um, more people are gonna be homeless. It's a bit like when we did a report on fuel poverty. There are three causes of fuel poverty. Poverty, the price of fuel, and the quality of housing, insulation. Well, the problem with homelessness is the supply of houses, of homes for people to live in, and the characteristics that determine which are the ones who are gonna miss out and end up homeless. And then the other imperative is support for homeless people. So to make the point again, that the six domains in which we made recommendations do apply to homelessness. So the importance of the early years, experienced homelessness during child abuse, uh, during childhood. I spent some time with a cop. This was not the one who found me drinking in my tuxedo, or my bicycle. Um, he was a wonderful man who had been, you probably know who he is, I've forgotten his name, who had been head of homicide investigation in Strathclyde and then decided he saw the light. He wanted to, he changed his job description, wanted to become head of homicide prevention. He said the best thing I as a policeman can do is recommend that there should be more health visitors. That's no ordinary cop. He thinks the best thing to do for homicide is to invest in health visitors for early childhood. And he told me a story of a young man who goes before a judge, he committed homicide, 
And he, this terrible story of child abuse and rotating partners that his mother had had and shifting houses and dropping out of school and so on and so forth. And this was all laid before the judge. And the judge said, nothing unusual about that. Well, statistically, that may be true. Nothing unusual about that for somebody who comes before the judge. But it's a ghastly story that led to this young person getting into trouble. So the early years are vital. Education, employment. Empl unemployment's a bit like homelessness, isn't it? It's the individuals who are not employable and it's the supply of jobs. If there are fewer jobs, they're gonna be more unemployed and more unemployed young people. We're concerned in this country about a million young people without jobs. In Spain, 52% of 18 to 24 year olds are at least not officially employed. I mean, there must be a big black market in the informal economy. But unemployment for young people is a public health emergency. We said something really radical in my review. Everybody should have the minimum income necessary for a healthy life. What a radical idea that in a rich country, everybody should have the minimum, the minimum necessary for a healthy life. We have enough money sloshing about to do that. We just have to have the political will to make it happen. And that's unlikely to be achieved by the current set of fiscal policies that we see before us. I'm sorry the minister had to leave early. Um, story of my life, actually, the number of times I've shared a platform with a minister and I'm just ready to suck it to her and she's gone. You know. <laughs> community, isolation from families, friends, and other support networks, and then, of course, ill health as a contributor to homelessness and as a consequence of homelessness. So how do people become homeless? Dispute with parents and step-parents, dispute with partners excluded from school, former prisoners, former army personnel, and a whole range of issues uh, that lead to problems. When we interviewed civil servants from my Whitehall 2 study who lost their jobs, and these are civil servants in, who'd been in stable employment, who lost their jobs, and one of them saying, I felt I was only one step away from Cardboard City. Somebody in a stable job, he loses his job and feels he's only one step away from Cardboard City. <sighs> So we have a continuum, rough sleepers and the homeless, but there's hidden homeless because we've got a lack of housing. We sold off the housing, we stopped building, we've got a lack of housing. So there's overcrowding, substandard housing and unaffordable housing. I heard John Humphreys uh, talking on the Today program this morning about the price of energy. I was just waiting for him to say fuel poverty People are suffering, they're getting sick because of the price of energy. And that's part of our housing crisis. The changing context. The dark green here is neighborhoods that are unaffordable with housing benefit. So if you have housing benefit, you can't afford to live there. That's 2011, that's the projection to 2016. And you can see how the dark green is spreading. What about the people who are cleaning the offices here? What about the nursing assistants here? What about the people who are doing these vital jobs without which the whole thing grinds to a halt? But they can't afford to live there. They've got to live somewhere else. Is that really the way we want to run things? You, you're poor. We want you to work here to clean our offices, but we want you to live somewhere else. 
And then we wonder that people end up on the streets. And this recently published child poverty map, children in poverty, there we are. I explain to foreigners when I go that, you know, the Olympics with that lovely stadium and so on, you go from where I work at UCL out to the Olympics and that's what you go through, these areas of dreadful poverty. And we took this to, um, to show them East London, to show them the Olympic site, but to show them East London and what really happens on the way out there. And the estimated distribution of population growth is going to be in the areas of poverty. And there's a big question of whether we're just going to create more areas of poverty or are we actually going to improve things. Underlying everything that I've been doing here is bringing the best evidence to bear on what the likely health impacts are of policies across a whole range of areas. But there's something else. And the reason that I called my English review Fair Society, Healthy Lives is, as some of you have heard me say before, that we need to put fairness at the heart of all policy making. I'm slightly distressed that I gave my report that title because the politicians use the word fairness as if it has no meaning at all. Whatever they do, they say it's fair. Cutting the top rate of tax is a fair settlement. Cutting benefits is fair. Cutting housing benefits is fair. When I debated with the former health secretary, Andrew Lansley, at BMA House, I said to him, I use the word fairness in a particular way. Inequalities in health that are judged to be avoidable by reasonable means and are not avoidable are unfair. Therefore, any policies that retard progress toward reducing these avoidable health inequalities are unfair. So I've got a criterion. Will your policies lead to reduction in avoidable health inequalities? Or will they lead to increase in avoidable health inequalities? If they're likely to lead to an increase in avoidable health inequalities, they are unfair. So let's put fairness at the heart of all policy making and health will improve and health inequalities will diminish.